So thank you for that introduction and for this opportunity to come talk to you all today. Uh, I've been really excited to hear all of these presentations and I'm actually gonna touch on a lot of what's already been spoken about and kind of circle back to it. Uh, but I've been asked to talk today about telehealth from the physician perspective. Uh, as was mentioned, I also wear a couple of hats. I'm a geriatrician. I'm an oncologist clinically. Uh, I research care delivery models in polypharmacy. And administratively, my role is in informatics within my division. So just a very brief background on telehealth. As most of you probably know, it's been reimbursable for a long time, since 1997. However, due to limitations on reimbursement uh, and restrictions, it, you know, implementation has really lagged our technology. Uh, we have the technology to deliver a lot of this care, but not a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of inertia about implementation. And fast forward to the pandemic, a lot of those restrictions have been quickly lifted, perhaps temporarily, perhaps not. And there's been very rapid uptake amongst Medicare beneficiaries in the early phase of the pandemic, as you can see here. So within my cancer center, I've been kind of keeping track of this data. I've been overseeing the telemedicine rollout uh, within the cancer center. And we see in March, our visits dropped off pretty dramatically as they did in most places. And we pretty quickly ramped up and came back to full capacity with telemedicine. And at least in our population, uh, the older and younger populations, as far as accessing this, look pretty similar. We are in a very, we cover a very rural population in upstate and western New York. So you can see the prominence of phone visits even now. Uh, and about, it's kind of evened out about 30% of our visits are telehealth visits. So a lot's been mentioned about this digital divide in age. Uh, Dr. Tobin presented some of this data uh, from the Pew Research Center. And I want you to notice two things from this figure. Number one is that there's a gap across all of these devices, uh, across all of these technologies. But there's also, if you look at the slope of the lines, they're pretty parallel. So there's a gap. They're not necessarily widening related to age. Uh, it's more like a lag uh, in people catching up at, at older ages. And I think, as has been argued several times during these presentations, age is not really the whole story. There are intersecting and interacting factors that modify this. So if you look at education and household income, for example, um, that really modifies the effective age. And really, you know, with telehealth to really deliver it, we're talking about home broadband to really get the video component uh, to be able to be uh, successful in delivering this care. Dr. Singh uh, alluded to this paper, which I recommend everybody read. It came out a couple days ago. This was a survey of 4,500 Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, mean age was right about 80 years. So this is really relevant data. And also a pretty diverse uh, population was surveyed. And what they estimate is about 38% of older adults are not ready for telemedicine. And they sort of grouped that unreadiness by technology issues, so access or comfort with technology, and age-related issues, things like vision, cognition, or hearing. But again, age is not the entire story. They again found that things like race, uh, geographic location, education, income, and even self-rated health uh, really modified the, the assessment of readiness. And so some of the people that most need to access high levels of care are the least able to do it in the COVID era. So on the other hand, so I've been doing uh, geriatric uh, remote visits now since the pandemic started, uh, and I've seen a lot of benefits to this for older adults. Uh, obviously, it limits reliance on others for mobility and transportation. I would love to hear about the from the patients and the the, the caregivers about their experience. I think Ms. Pract um, shared a little bit of experience with. Uh, uh, you know, patients uh, comfort level with this technology. But I've really been gratified that patients are really glad to welcome me into their homes. There's some very interesting literature on about how computer mediated uh, um, communication can actually perhaps increase disclosure in medical settings. Uh, I've also found that I've really uh, been able to evaluate their home environment. I've actually had family members or sometimes the patient themselves, if they're mobile, take their tablet around with the, with the camera and show me their hallways, show me 
if there's throw rugs, show me if there's a lot of clutter, how they get around during the day, and perhaps pertinent for this discussion, their medication setup. So I have a lot of difficulty getting patients to bring in their medications. They just forget. So to really do a good medication review is difficult in the clinic. Uh, so this has actually been easier for me to do medication reviews. I ask them to bring me to where they keep their medications, and I can see, are they using pill boxes? Is, are there a bunch of empty pill bottles spilled everywhere? What does it look like where they keep their medication? And obviously, it's also easier for their family to join even remotely if they're not in the house. So for this talk, I wanted to go look at models of care that have specifically telemedicine models of care that have been studied and specifically in older adults. So I didn't have to look far. Uh, Dr. Dorsey is here at the University of Rochester, and he's been doing virtual house calls for patients with Parkinson's disease for a long time, and he's reported his randomized trial of just under 200 patients. And there was no difference between virtual house calls and usual in-person care in quality of life or clinical outcomes, high satisfaction with the virtual visits, and actually a pretty marked preference for virtual visits. The caveat here is that to get access to this trial, people actually had to go sign up on an online portal, meaning by definition, they had to have internet access and, and almost all of them had internet at home. They were 96% white and 73% college educated, again, missing uh, a very large proportion of the population. Uh, this is a community-based trial that's in progress in palliative care. Palliative care obviously brings, in a lot of cases, brings the care to the patient already in the setting of hospice. Uh, but during the COVID era, they're also looking at how they can deliver this care virtually using a team approach. So getting a lot of people in a team to deliver virtual care. And so I don't have data to share with you yet, but what Dr. Kluger told me is that, yes, there's kind of some more resistance with older adults than with younger adults, but he finds that with appropriate support, he can often kind of get them over the hump, so to speak. And then lastly, I mentioned this trial uh, because I'm familiar with it. It's my trial. Uh, it's an NCI-funded trial to look at deprescribing interventions in older adults with uh, cancer and polypharmacy. It is cluster randomized by oncologist. And a couple of things I wanted to point out that circle back to prior presentations. Uh, right now, I'm in the pre-implementation phase, what I think Dr. Rothschild would call the shut up and listen phase. Uh, so I'm shutting up and listening and doing sort of a, uh, an iterative adaptation as a lead into this trial. So not a statistical adaptation, but an implementation adaptation, because what I'm looking at is a pharmacist-led virtual deprescribing intervention. And so the other point I would echo is Dr. Drs. Blyler, Dr. Chen, um, I would amplify what they're saying about really the role for pharmacists and pharmacist-led interventions here. I, um, this is what I've, the model that I've been working with, and it's a very powerful model. Um, and then lastly, Dr. Tobin mentioned these hybrid effectiveness uh, implementation trials. That's also built into this trial, as you can see, uh, with the aims uh, of both efficacy and implementation. And I would like to see this wrapped into a lot more trials, particularly those in older adults, to see not only what the efficacy outcomes are, but how did it work? How is it going to work in pragmatic real world settings? And do we need to modify the delivery of the intervention for different groups? So coming back to clinic, um, in geriatric oncology, we've been actually doing remote geriatric assessment data collection, including PROs, uh, for a long time. I think at University of Rochester, it's been for well over 10 years. Now, that initially started out very low tech with actual thick uh, paper packets that we mailed out to patients, and it pretty successful. We had high rates of completion of this. Most tools in geriatric assessment are patient-reported with reasonable concordance with objective measures. Um, so, uh, you know, this is, this is, you know, you can get a lot of data remotely. Uh, we're now looking at doing this through the patient portal, through the EMR, collecting it that way, or through web platforms and software, mobile health, so mHealth platforms to collect this PRO data are all things that we're working on here. But the most difficult to measure has been cognition. So, 
People with dementia or cognitive impairment have difficulty accessing this technology. It's also quite difficult to measure this remotely. We've been trying to do it here uh, during the pandemic and we're finding it's very tough. We are using tests that have been validated for virtual administration like the MOCA, which is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the BLESSED which you can give over the telephone. And we've been giving about four to five a week at our institution uh, virtually. And what the, what the administra uh, people administering the tests are telling me, they're seeing high rates of difficulty with hearing the questions, about 20%, as well as limited reliability. They're not really trusting the results that they're getting. Um, they're reporting uh, patients are actually kind of cheating on the test. Uh, they're having difficulty monitoring some of the attention and interaction uh, questions on the test. So another thing we're looking at here mm -hmm. is platforms. Here you have two minutes to go. Please Great, go. thank you. So we're looking at platforms. Dr. Tobin presented some of these M Health, E Health platforms. I am an optimist about technology. I don't think it can solve all of our ills, but um, I tend to be an optimist on the technology side. So we are working with a company that's doing a cognitive assessment platform with a patient facing side, collects PROs, and collects the objective measures. Um, as well as a physician-facing or clinic-facing side that gives summaries, gives um, normative scoring over time, and gives some recommendations linked to that. And, you know, they're really looking at innovative ways that they can um, mimic the in-person experience, particularly for older adults. So these are delivered on iPads with a stylus trying to mimic um, paper administration, which is how most of these are administered. And they're also, I'll see if this video works here. It doesn't look like my embedded video is working for whatever reason, but what I was intending to show is they're actually building in some human computer interaction components. They can actually track attention. They can track whether the um, participants are looking away from the screen. They can do eye tracking uh, and log all of that to try to mimic what a clinician would be able to measure doing this in person. So my takeaway messages, um, I would wanna echo a lot of the former presenters that we need to think about access. So I wanna think access, not necessarily age. So age is part of it, but there is a lot of um, intersectionality and a lot of other factors to think about, not just one at a time. Uh, to echo Dr. Singh, again, ac I think access to home digital technology in the COVID era and beyond is access to healthcare. So I would argue that internet enabled devices and tech support to get uh, those to be usable are medical needs. And we need to be thinking about how to uh, support that either through reimbursement or through wrapping it into clinical trial budgets, things like that. Certainly age is part of it. Some people will have age-related barriers to telemedicine, like hearing, vision, cognition. So we need to think about for those groups how to bring the technology and support to them. So is it home-based? Is it somewhere out in the community? Do they come into a spoke site where we set them up with the technology, but they can still connect to a hub without traveling that long distance for that specialized care? How do we need to tailor our software to be able to accommodate these needs? Um, so basically we need more implementation research and we need that to be baked in to uh, the clinical trials that we're doing, whether it's drug development and research or other research. And I think we can use the unfortunate opportunity of the pandemic to really rapidly iterate, collect some pilot data for this work and develop ideas to test.